Uh, our group in Kiti is, is a young group in the study of stem cell. Uh, we actually work in uh, medical genetics and uh, I will show you uh, which is the, the way that uh, brought us to the study of uh, uh, stem cells. But first of all, I would like to introduce you our university, this is University of Chieti. Chieti is a very small town in the Middle Italy, and there is just this very beautiful campus uh, and uh, nothing else outside the university. Um, in, in Sunday, mothers used to go with their children uh, in the grasses of the university because it's the um, most nice place in the town. Um, we have the several buildings, and uh, we have a group of people uh, which works in uh, in the field of stem cell, this group is called STEM Tech, and my group has two labs. The, the first, the lab of molecular genetics is in this building, and in this other building, which is the center for uh, uh, sciences about aging, there is the second lab, which is the lab of uh, uh, functional uh, genomics. Here we perform stem cell culture, and here we perform molecular analysis of uh, mostly of transcriptome, genome and transcriptome. And this window is the window of my office, uh, which is not a lab, unfortunately, but it's, it's uh, the office of the direction of the department in which I spend most of my life. And uh, there is uh, uh, each day less time for science, and it's absolutely a pity. But I was telling you that we came from molecular genetics, and usually, People working in medical genetics use to face patients and to face DNA sequencing. So, um, which is the reason that uh, um, induced us to start to work with amniotic fluid stem cell? It is that uh, if you work in medical genetics, you have to do with the amniotic fluid because you have to perform prenatal diagnosis. And prenatal diagnosis in Italy is very diffused. Uh, one in five pregnant women undergoing invasive prenatal diagnosis, which is about uh, um, a, a lot of uh, diagnosis each year in Italy, 500 just uh, in our center in, uh, uh, in Chieti. So we have a lot of samples that we can use, and inside the amniotic fluid, there are different kind of cells. Uh, there are the amniotic fluid specific cells, the AF type, which uh, came from fetal membranes and trophoblasts, and these are uh, the cells which are investigated for the study of karyotype. And we have two different populations, which are the fibroblastic cells, the F type, and the epithelioid cells, the E type, coming probably from uh, derma fibroblast and fibrous connective tissue. Uh, the F type and from urine and fetal skin, the E type. But it is not, it's not sure. And uh, I would like to show you this afternoon, which is probably the real origin of this cell, which is not so simple. Um, if you grow it in culture these cells, you can easily distinguish the F cells, which have this kind of shape, and the E cells, which are uh, round shaped. Um, Starting from uh, 2003, more or less, a, a number of papers have reported the suggestion that inside the amniotic fluid there were uh, stem cells. And uh, uh, the most important study in this field is the one published by the group of uh, Paolo Coppi, which is uh, an Italian from Padova, but uh, um, he works in London. And uh, this paper, which was published in uh, Nature Biotechnology, showed that if you select with CKIT uh, cells uh, from amniotic fluid, and CKIT is uh, a very small amount of cells within the amniotic fluid, you can have cells which are able to undergo different differentiations, such as adipogenic, osteogenic, myogenic, endothelia, and so on. And uh, this, the clonal origins of all the cell lines has been demonstrated. Um, what is very interesting is that these cells are very stable. Uh, after several passage, they have a, a normal karyotype. And another very interesting feature is the immunological feature of these cells, because uh, these cells coming from uh, uh, amniotic fluid uh, do not express HLA-DR. And so they are resistant to rejection because they express immunosuppressive factors such as CD59 and HLA-G. 
Uh, this is very important because the idea is that these cells could survive after allogenic transplant without immunosuppressive therapy. And it means that it should be possible to create banks for allogenic clinical application. Um, so suddenly we discovered that we had uh, some amniotic fluid and that after prenatal diagnosis, we had some samples that uh, it, it was possible to investigate just to have a look about these cells. And uh, so Ivan Antonucci, which is uh, here this afternoon, started in my lab to work uh, and starting from this idea that uh, amniotic fluid stem cell could represent a very interesting novel source because uh, these kind of cells uh, are uh, large accessible because uh, as I told you before, a great number of amniocentesis are routinely performed each week uh, in each center with medical genetics in Italy. They are able to differentiate in several cell lineages. They show normal karyotype. And if you transplant these cells in nude mice, you don't have the formation of teratomas. And uh, uh, very important in Italy, there is no ethical problem in the use of this cell. Although there is in Italy some people that is against prenatal diagnosis. And so uh, someone says that it's possible to use uh, amniotic membrane, so placenta at the end of the pregnancy, but not amniotic uh, fluid. Uh, in any way, prenatal diagnosis is a law of the Italian state, so it, 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 there is nothing wrong in using these cells. Um, what is very interesting is that <clears throat> these cells, in, in the several reports which have been published, showed uh, a very wide ability to differentiate in different uh, tissues, uh, and it has been demonstrated that they can became bone, fat, muscle, capillaries, nerve, liver, and uh, this uh, wide range of differentiation um, led to the suggestion that probably these are not multipotent cells, uh, but uh, they can be considered something like pluripotent cells. This is a very recent uh, paper in which uh, the only one uh, differentiation which was debated until now, which is this one, uh, the neurogenic, uh, uh, seems to be very real because a comparison between uh, the ability of neuronal differentiation of uh, mesenchymal stem cells from amniotic fluid and bone marrow showed clearly that amniotic fluid is uh, more efficient in uh, providing a neural differentiation. And again, the karyotype anyway is stable. And again, if you transplant the uh, cells derived from amniotic fluid in nude mice, you don't have teratomas. So the question is, where we put amniotic fluid in this kind of uh, hierarchic ladder? Uh, are these cells multipotent, pluripotent, or something in the middle? Um, they, they are able to differentiate in uh, uh, tissues from all the three germ layers, but they are not able to induce teratomas, which is a feature typical of embryonic stem cells. And as I told you, that functional differentiation in uh, um, neurogenic uh, cells uh, were, uh, was debated. So we started to work, uh, and we started more or less uh, seven years ago, and the questions were, which is the origin of these cells? Can be considered as pluripotent, can be used in regenerative medicine protocols. Uh, the first and the second question are very related because uh, we, we usually think that pluripotent cells are only the cells of the inner cell mass, which is of course true. But uh, there is a, another region in which you can have pluripotent cells, and it is the epiblast. Because also after the formation of the three layers uh, of mesoderm, endoderm, and ectoderm, there is this uh, small region, the epiblast, in which there are the primordial germ cells. And these primordial germ cells, which uh, will produce sperms and eggs, must be pluripotent. Um, the first novelty of our protocols was that the majority of studies, included the one of Paolo De Coppi, was based on the CKIT selection of cells. But we started to work on unselected AF cells because 
Uh, since there is a great heterogeneity in, in the cellular population of, of the fluid, we, we decided to have a look to what happened without selection. And without selection, uh, uh, the literature says that the ability of differentiation of secret positive and unselected cells is quite similar. There is just uh, a, a, some little difference in adipogenic uh, um, and in uh, cardiomyogenic ability of differentiation. But uh, we discovered that there are some interesting features because secret selected cells do not express some markers that we have found to be expressed in our cells, uh, which are SOX2. Uh, secret cells are able to uh, show the expression of OCT4 and NANG-NOG, but not SOX2. Unselected cells are able to produce SOX2. Second, secret cells, secret positive cells, are negative to uh, alkaline phosphatase, while our cells are positive. And finally, uh, I will show you in a few minutes that our cells are able to express a number of markers of primordial germ cells, which are not present in secret positive cells. Um, not all are present. There are uh, some is present as uh, diesel, but not all these markers. Um, our protocol is based from, starts from the collection of samples uh, from women at uh, 16 weeks of pregnancy. And uh, uh, these cells uh, uh, are very stable. Uh, you can cultivate for a very, very long time. And uh, uh, first point, I I'll show you some of the people which in Kieti, uh, not directly in my group, but uh, gave us uh, their expertise for the collaboration. This is Marco Marchisio. And uh, this is uh, the cellular phenotype on the cells. It's very interesting uh, that they are positive for mesenchymal markers. Uh, so actually, they are considered as mesenchymal cells uh, because they are positive for uh, CD90 and, and other markers and are negative for the hematopoietic markers. But very interesting is that they are positive for OCT4, SSA4, SOX2, uh, but they are, in our sample, they were negative for CD117, which is the CKIT. Uh, but probably this is because the CKIT population is very, very small. I told you before, less than 1%. So probably this system is not able to recognize, but the cell should be present. Otherwise, it means that in our culture, these cells are not able to proliferate. We, we still don't know. We started to analyze the presence of typical markers of pluripotency, and we discovered that in our cells, until the uh, sixth passage, we have the expression of nanog, OCT4, SOX2, uh, CMYK, KL4, uh, and so on. And we discovered that actually the messenger RNA for CKIT is present. Not the protein, not the phenotype, but the uh, messenger RNA is actually present. So there is not the selection against this cell, but just we were not able to detect the protein. Very interestingly, also a number of embryonic markers were present, like DAPA4, DAPA3, and, and others. So these cells, uh, from the point of view of the uh, expression of messenger RNA, are very similar to pluripotent and embryonic uh, stem cells. But what is, uh, in my opinion, the most interesting point of the story is the expression of, of all these markers of the premeiotic, meiotic, and post-meiotic phases of gametogenesis. These markers are typically expressed in primordial germinal cells. And this is the first model of uh, uh, human stem cells which are able to express all these markers. So the hypothesis is that actually they came from the epiblast. And so they are actually cells with fissures of primordial gem cells. I will show uh, at the end of the story that there are uh, now some very interesting proof about this. Uh, we next uh, uh, tried to obtain an embro embryoid body from these cells because the ability to create an embryoid body is another uh, important feature of pluripotency. And with the hanging drop technique, we were able to obtain embryoid bodies at day 5, day 15, which were uh, positive for uh, um, uh, alkaline phosphatase. And uh, these embryoid bodies express markers of the three different germ layers. 
and uh, in uh, uh, after immunocytochemical staining, these embryonic bodies were positive for OCT4, uh, SOX2, and uh, well, there are other images that um, I, I, I not show, but in which it's possible to observe that the positivity of uh, to OCT4 and SOX is different in the different areas of the embryonic body if you use a confocal microscopy to make some section. This part of the uh, work has been made uh, by uh, Roberta Di Pietro in our university. Um, since uh, we'd like to have several proof of the uh, fact that these cells were pluripotent, we analyzed another biomarker of pluripotency, which is the presence of alternative splice variants. Uh, this gene, SALA4, show uh, two isoform uh, due to an alternative sp uh, splicing, and uh, the SALA4B is present just in pluripotent cells, and it has been demonstrated by uh, this study, showing that cells positive for uh, SALA4B uh, are, able, are um, positive for uh, phos alkaline phosphatase. And a second important gene is uh, DNA methyltransferase 3B, uh, in which there is a splice variant, uh, including exon 10, which is uh, expressed at higher levels just in pluripotent stem cells. So we study a number of uh, genes which use to uh, uh, show uh, alternative splicing in three different kinds of cells, in cells from embryoid bodies, in uh, undifferentiated uh, uh, amniotic fluid stem cells, and in the amniotic fluid stem cell differentiated into precursors or endothelial cells. And uh, for, for a number of these markers, there was no difference, but other showed the important difference. The most important was that the uh, DNA methyltransferase 3B was present only with the um, isoform, including exon 10 in the embryoid bodies. And uh, the same was for uh, SALA 4B, which was not present uh, in differentiated cells, a little present in uh, um, undifferentiated cells, but was definitely present in embryoid bodies. Um, again, uh, we studied the expression of genes involved in epigenetic mechanism, and we showed that, that in embryoid bodies, a DNA methyltransferase 3A was not expressed. Uh, while there was expression uh, in differentiated uh, amniotic fluid cells uh, differentiated in uh, endothelial cells and in undifferentiated amniotic fluid cells. And this is, again, uh, an idea that cells in our embryoid bodies are uh, pluripotent. Finally, we investigated the mechanism of X chromosome inactivation. You know that uh, X chromosome inactivation is a very important marker of pluripotency because both in females, both X chromosomes are inactivated after fertilization. Then there is a, a, an a inactivation of one X chromosome, but there is a reactivation in the inner cell mass. Then again, a, a inactivation, and again, a random reactivation just in the uh, epiblast. And uh, this is due to the fact that SOX2, OCT4, and NANON are able to inhibit the expression of exist, which is the gene able to induce the inactivation of the X chromosome, while T6, which is a, a, a gene which stops the inactivation, is currently expressed. And again, uh, in our studies, uh, female and female, we do not have the expression of exist in embryonic bodies while we have the expression of uh, exist in female undifferentiated amniotic fluid cells. Uh, sorry, and uh, this is uh, for T6. Uh, T6 is uh, expressed in embryoid body and not expressed in, in the other cells. So uh, in embryoid body, the, uh, one or the, both X chromosomes are active, and this is another marker of pluripotency. So conclusion of this first part of, of this talk is that uh, uh, our cells, the amniotic fluid stem cells, show some features very similar to pluripotent cells since they express typical markers of primordial germ cells and in particular genes involved in early stages of germ cell development. This is very important because we are now thinking to use these cells uh, as a model to test uh, 
uh, the, the activity of some drugs which are used to fight male and uh, uh, female infertility because we have an in vitro model of uh, germ cell development. And these cells are able to form in vitro three-dimensional aggregates, uh, very similar to embryoid bodies. And we have very recently published these results. Uh, the, the full paper uh, will, uh, will appear, I think, in the next issue of cell transplantation. Uh, you can just find the abstract on, uh, on PubMed. Um, the results I showed are in agreement with results from other group which came uh, more or less uh, independently from us. This is the group of Paolo De Coppia and Anthony Atala. Uh, this is the group which works with the CKIT positive cells and they discovered and published that if they use uh, uh, the first trimester cells, not the second, our cells are in the second trimester because uh, prenatal diagnosis is carried out in second trimester. They, they, they started to, to study some abortion and in the first trimester, uh, trimester, it was possible to see just who have seen in our cells and to suggest that also their cells originate from primordial germ cells or primordial germ cell progenitors retaining the amniotic fluid at the start of their migration to the genital uh, ridge. Uh, so the difference is that we have cells which have in the second trimester the fissures that uh, CKIT positive selected cells show in the first uh, trimester. But the, the very important difference is that in the first trimester, trimester you can have cells just from abortion, while in the second you can have from uh, normal women. This is very important uh, for the uh, idea to banking these cells. And this is another very, very interesting paper which appeared recently on uh, PLOS One. Uh, this paper demonstrated uh, um, the same result we showed. Uh, well, well I, I mean, they, they have uh, very beautiful colors as compared to our experiments, I have to say. Anyway, the results are very similar uh, because they assess that uh, uh, amniotic fluid stem cells have properties of pluripotent stem cells, and they made a very deep investigation of the transcriptome of these cells. At the end of the story, discovered that the transcriptome of these cells is in the middle between the typical transcriptome of mesenchymal stem cells and embryonic stem cells. So it's really a novel class of cells, but what is most important, that there is a, a strong variability among different samples, mostly related to gestational age. This is a very uh, important point since we study only cells at the same period because we always perform amniocentesis uh, in the same period of uh, pregnancy. Uh, this study tells us that if you analyze cells at different periods, we have different transcriptomes. And uh, this latter study, very, it, uh, this is a, a prepub, uh, this study demonstrated that if you take amniotic fluid stem cells, it's able to induce a differentiation to primordial follicle oocytes in vitro. And again, you have a number of demonstrations, which is a very important proof that they derive from primordial germ cells. And of course, it's very stimulating because it, this study gives the idea that it could be possible from this cell to produce gametes. Of course, this is not an idea related to an application such uh, uh, in vitro uh, fertilization. It is to study the biology of the gametes. Otherwise, you can just imagine in Italy what will happen if we are able to say that we are able to produce sperms and oocytes in vitro. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, the second part of the talk is uh, related to the application of these cells in cellular therapy. These cells is a novel model. So if you have a look to uh, um, www.clinicaltrials.gov, uh, you will find a very uh, little number of clinical trials with these cells because it's a very novel model. But there are very interesting preclinical results and this is a list of the most important 
uh, trials in animal models, uh, uh, which uh, has been carried out uh, uh, for, uh, um, with the aim to obtain uh, uh, the regeneration of muscle, nerve, kidney, lung, heart, and so on. Uh, of course, I'll not discuss with you everything, but I would like to show you some results of our group. At the beginning, we started uh, uh, to work uh, in the osteogenic differentiation uh, for a very simple reason. These cells are very able to differentiate in, uh, in osteogenic cells because they are mesenchymal cells, so their way uh, is this. Their, their natural way is to make bone. Uh, and we demonstrated that these cells can be easily differentiated with a single protocol, and you can obtain uh, in 30 days the production of, uh, um, um, of bone. This is an alizarin red staining. And uh, then we moved to the uh, preclinical uh, direction, and we demonstrated that uh, uh, if you spread your cells on a screw used for uh, uh, orthopedic implantology, these cells are able to grow up this screw. And so we started to use this model on uh, animal model. Uh, the study is currently in progress. Uh, uh, however, the idea is uh, that uh, uh, if you compare the results in rats in which you induced a lesion in the bone and you didn't um, make any kind of treatment, and you compare the treatment with the typical scaffold which you used in, in orthopedy and the scaffold plus amniotic fluid stem cells, it looks that the time of bone regeneration is shorter, but also, I have to say, that sometimes uh, there is the production of uh, too much bone. So probably we have to reduce uh, the number of cells or something similar. But uh, mm, while we, <coughs> we were performing these studies, uh, we, uh, we had a new field of study, which was generated uh, by the meeting with these two people, David S. from the Georgia Health Science University of Augusta, and mostly Cesar Borlong on the University of South Florida in Tampa. These two guys are two of the most uh, relevant experts in the world about uh, preclinical models of cellular therapy in stroke. And stroke is a very important disease. Um, if you are wondering uh, which is the meaning of this picture, is that the only thing that you can find in common between Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin uh, is that they all had stroke during uh, their life. So stroke made the history of the uh, last century in, uh, in Europe. Um, and anyway, it's a very common disease and is the third leading cause of that. And the leading cause for disability in USA and two out of every uh, 1,000 adult Americans will experience their first stroke in every given year. In 40% of patients, uh, uh, some permanent injury remains. Um, we know some risk factor for stroke, uh, the age, the sex, the genetic factor. Uh, males are uh, um, at higher risk uh, than females for stroke. Uh, I used to say at this point that it is because females are a risk factor of stroke for males and this explain this difference. But usually females don't like very much this kind of sentence. Anyway, and the lifestyle, the use of smoke, alcohol abuse, diet, drugs, and so on. But uh, um, <clears throat> when, when discussing with Cesar Bolong, and he published a, a, a number of, of paper, and their model was the bone marrow. They had a very strong experience in the transplantation of rats submitted to stroke with bone marrow cells. And they, um, uh, Caesar and David, they were telling that in their experience, the younger was the donors of bone marrow, uh, human, the transplant were human to rat, and the most efficient, the transplantation. And uh, this, this is because, in their opinion, uh, the uh, old model of the replacement of non-functional cells by the transplantation uh, was not probably true, uh, or was not the, the only model, because the only mention is because actually probably uh, the most important mention is with the secretion of neurotrophic factors and the stimulation of endogenous neurogenesis, and probably younger uh, cells 
uh, were um, more able to perform this kind of functions. So my question was, but if we need young stem cells, what about amniotic fluid stem cells? We, uh, we cannot find uh, uh, anything younger. And so we started this collaboration and uh, we started to, uh, to treat a, a, a rat model of stroke. Stroke is induced by a median cerebral artery occlusion. And uh, after stroke, uh, we perform uh, a number of tests in these rats to evaluate their uh, motor function and their neurological function. Of course, this is not the real test. Um, the real test is made by, by this kind of uh, studies, uh, the beam balance walking, the open field, uh, the Morris water mains, and so on. Th these tests are uh, quite simple and uh, very, very few expensive. Uh, so it's possible <clears throat> to, to give a score to the rat uh, before the stroke, after the stroke, uh, and after the transplantation. Uh, sorry, our first protocol was to transplant human cells in rats, and this kind of study is uh, still ongoing, uh, but um, I, I missed the slide here, but uh, I think you can trust me. What we observed is that after transplantation, if you, uh, if you label the human cells, uh, after transplantation, you have an improvement of the function of the motor and neurological function, but in the brain of the rat, there are very few human cells. Very, very few are present, but there are very few. Uh, but uh, while these studies are ongoing, we have, uh, um, uh, we have completed another branch of the study, which was the transplant uh, rat on uh, rat. And in this case, the approach was quite different because the idea was to uh, uh, wait uh, 35 days after cell transplantation. Why? Because we, we had two models in mind. The, the first was the acute stroke. The second was the chronic stroke. So we had the results before in this second model, the chronic stroke, in which we demonstrated uh, that uh, there is a recovery of motor deficit and the volume of uh, infarct after amniotic fluid uh, cells transplantation. Uh, in blue, you can see the effect of amniotic fluid cells, and in red is the vehicle. Um, These this results, uh, are, are very interesting because uh, uh, in the subventricular zone and in the, in the dentus gyratus, uh, there is uh, a, a very interesting proliferation of uh, neurogenic precursor uh, as demonstrated by the presence of uh, specific markers. And uh, um, the number of cells which were positive with th these markers was too high to be represented by transplanted cells. In this, in this case, uh, we were not able to differentiate uh, between the cells because the transplanted cells were not labeled. But uh, in each case, we had uh, a, a response which was uh, not possibly related to the transplanted cell. We had an endogenous reaction. So the model that we hypothesized is that after transplantation, we have an upregulation of neurotrophic factors, and we have a proliferation of upregulated endogenous cells with an increased endogenous neuronal differentiation, a rescue of the penumbra after uh, um, the, the stroke, and the recovery on behavior and, um, and cognitive uh, abilities. Um, of course, this opened the, 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 the window to, to a lot of possible uh, studies uh, uh, to try to, to have a look to what is present in the secret home of these cells, uh, to try to induce the overexpression of some neurotrophic factors such as BDNF and others. And uh, uh, this is one of the reasons uh, for which I am here, because I, I think that you could help us uh, in a very strong way. Uh, anyway, we, we, we observed also another feature is that uh, 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 it was possible to identify some genes involved uh, in this therapeutic activity. We, we're, we anyway uh, work in molecular genetics, so we have the facilities to, to study uh, this feature. And uh, so we, we, we compared the, the transcriptome of uh, um, uh, amniotic fluid stem cells after culture, so after expansion of the stem cells, 
uh, to the transcriptome of fresh amniotic fluid, the one in which uh, the stem cell population has not been uh, enlarged. And we discovered that there was a strong differentiation. We found more than 1,000 upregulated genes and more than 500 downregulated genes in cultured amniotic fluid stem cells. But what's in most interesting, uh, this is an interactomic analysis. Uh, when we perform a, a transcriptome analysis, we, we do not anymore study the entire number of genes. We are interested to the network of genes playing a similar role. And we discovered uh, three very interesting network, which is the first one, the VAGFA, which is known to improve angiogenesis and cell migration and uh, to inhibit the apoptosis. So this is a network which would be very important in uh, the, um, the regeneration of tissue after stroke. The second network was the network uh, pointed around uh, uh, CXCL, which is an angiostatic factor playing a positive role in tissue repair. And the third one is uh, VUCAM with an increase of cell addition. This kind of approach, uh, we, we, are, we are moving to, to apply this kind of approach in the study of the stem sum of the brain of the rats. Uh, uh, after transplantation with human cell, we would like to take brains of this rat to extract, extract messenger RNA and have a look to which genes are expressed in the region of the lesion uh, in which the therapeutic effect is performed. So <clears throat> the conclusion of this second part is that uh, when transplanted in a rat model of stroke, uh, amniotic fluid stem cell induce a recovery of motor deficit uh, and uh, a reduction of, uh, in fact, volume. So probably they are useful in regenerative medicine protocols. Of course, uh, I don't love to say that in five years we will cure people with stroke. Uh, but it is a, a, a very, very little step in that direction. And uh, the overexpression of specific genes is related to the therapeutic efficiency. So the idea to induce an overexpression of some gene of uh, some MIRNA or something similar could be uh, uh, very, very interesting to study. Um, in very recently, to confirm these findings, uh, just this year, it has published this paper uh, in which uh, amniotic fluid in the third trimester, so not in the second, were used for the treatment of rats with uh, spinal cord injury. And very, very interesting is that uh, the authors uh, uh, have depicted this kind of flow chart in which, uh, again, uh, the preservation of myelin and the, the recovery of motor function is not due to a direct transformation of these cells in neurons, but to the secretion of factors, probably hepatocyte growth factor, and uh, from one side to a lower macrophage infiltration at the lesion site, and on the other side to increased levels of, again, VAGF at lesion site. So it's, it's a mechanism very similar to, to the one we have hypothesized. So what, what are we, we, we doing now, which are our work in progress? Uh, first of all, we are uh, trying to, to have a, differenti a neurogenic differentiation. Uh, actually, <clears throat> this is the, the most difficult task in this, in this field. However, we are trying, uh, starting from embryoid bodies with uh, retinoic acid and with uh, neuronal growth factor. And uh, uh, well, at least a very interesting change of morphology is obtained, uh, starting from undifferentiated cells when you use uh, retinoic acid. And you have a, a strong positive to the nesting, while in undifferentiated cells, nesting is negative. Uh, when we treat with NGF, again, we have positivity to the nesting, uh, while undifferentiated cells, again, are negative. The second field is cardiomyogenic differentiation. Uh, this is a part of the study which is carried out in collaboration with Angela di Baldassarre, again of our university. We treat cells uh, with ATSA 2-deoxycytidine, uh, and we have uh, a, a very strong change in the morphology. 
but mostly, and I know that here uh, it's very dangerous because it's your main field of interest, so I hope to be correcting what I, was, I am going to say. We have uh, not only some morphological uh, modification, but also a positivity to the sarcomeric alpha actinin after 10 days treatment, and the positive to other markers, CD90. Uh, these are on the left, uh, proliferation, and uh, in red is differentiation. And uh, uh, we have different in the expression of cardiac myosin, in sarcomeric alpha actinin, and in connexin, and so on. Uh, in this study, we are also having a look uh, to the behavior of genes related to the endocannabinoid system. And we have some very interesting features. The study is carried out together with the University of Teramo, with the group of Mauro Maccarone, uh, who showed that, that, that there is a very interesting increase in the expression of uh, several genes involved in the pathway of endocannabinoids when uh, you induce uh, differentiation in cardiomyocytes as compared to undifferentiated cells. Uh, finally, we are trying to make a reprogrammation of the cells by treating uh, with the reprogramming medium, which is the same used for uh, embryonic cells. Uh, these are <clears throat> very, very uh, preliminary results, but uh, there is uh, uh, the evidence that these cells uh, starting from day four, are able to form colonies, uh, which at day eight are more evident, and then day 15 more evident. And this is another important feature of pluripotent cells. So what next? Just a few slides to give you an idea of uh, what could be obtained in the future from this cell. The first is uh, when you perform prenatal diagnosis, in 97% of cases, the fetus actually is normal. But in 2.5%, you have an abnormal diagnosis because uh, this fetus can have a, a, a trisomy or another kind of an haploidy or a single gene disorder or a, any other kind of genetic disease. And you can imagine in this field that when we have amniotic fluid from uh, uh, that fetus, we have a, a, a powerful tool for modeling that genetic disease without the necessity to uh, have uh, induced pluripotent stem cells because we have pluripotent stem cells from the affected patients without any, any necessity to uh, reprogram in them. And uh, uh, we, in this field, we, we are trying to study Klinefelter syndrome uh, because uh, since I told you these cells derive from primordial stem cells, a disease involving uh, gametogenesis is the best model to study. Finally, it has been recently, very recently suggested that the cells that you can find in peripheral blood of the mothers during the pregnancy and also in other organs are amniotic fluid stem cells. You know that in this period there is a great interest from for non-invasive prenatal diagnosis uh, that you can perform just taking peripheral blood, but is made just on free fetal DNA. But if we will be able to collect these cells, and if these cells are amniotic fluid cells, we can cultivate these cells, and so we can perform uh, the diagnosis of a prenatal pathological condition uh, in, in, in a better way without any risk for the fetus and for the mother, just from peripheral blood, which could be a, a, a very important breakthrough in the field of prenatal diagnosis. So <clears throat> I have to thank a lot of people. This is my main role in this project, to have dinners with people. Uh, and um, uh, it is possible to understand just having a look to my sides. But uh, who performed uh, all the experiment is Ivan Antonucci. And this is Cesar Borong, and this is in Kieti when they made the stage with our uh, young PhD to, uh, um, to make them learn uh, to induce stroke in rats. There are, um, there are many persons working uh, in Kieti and outside Kieti in this project. And uh, um, I hope we will have in the next future 
uh, some uh, interesting results and, and I would be very glad to have some interesting results also in collaboration with this wonderful structure. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.